आज की ताजा खबर बेंगलुरु में रहने वाले लू और अमेरिका में रहने वाले सेठ आपसे कुछ बात करना चाहते हैं संगीतकार राजस के साथ आपका स्वागत है लू सिटी Nothing ever happens to the US. They have the world reserve currency. They have massive natural resources, and they are the mightiest military power on the planet. I think valuations coming down across the board is not such a bad idea. AI is particularly good at sweeping up like a giant vacuum cleaner all this data about me and sort of sucking it out of the universe, the virtual universe, and. Building a cogent picture, so I would be lying to you if I said at the age of eight I really wanted to be a finance professor. Hello, folks. A few days back, I had a great conversation with Professor Ramana Sonti from ISB. We discussed what it takes to be an academic, the balancing act between being a researcher and a teacher. At about the halfway mark in the podcast, we switched gears to talking about uh, the job market, recessions, startups, and valuations. and even how ai might eventually change the face of finance i hope you enjoy this episode we have uh, today with us um, a guest who is very very knowledgeable in the field of finance uh, he is my professor professor ramana sonti he taught me the subjects corporate finance and a subject called going public and going private which uh, basically talks about private equity venture capital and uh, doing an ipo and stuff um apart from that uh, professor ramana has also taught uh, op- uh, options and futures uh, portfolio management in isb and more such subjects uh, his his um, research consists of uh, you know uh, talking about go- corporate governance um the the links between economics and deep learning and institutional investor behaviors uh, the 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 bridge between financial and product markets and a lot more uh he has also taught in tulane university and bits pilani um he has he is also an engineer by the way in uh, the field of electronics like me uh he did it in uh, nit warangal he has uh, done his mba from uh, iim bangalore and has got his phd from michigan state university so welcome professor thank you lou uh, it's a pleasure to be here uh and most of everything you said is just my resume but i hope i'm a little more than that We'll see how this develops, but uh, looking forward to chat with you. Right, right. So, Prof, I mean, uh, that's exactly why I've called you to the podcast to get to know more about you and to get to know more about uh, what you think. What are your thoughts on a lot of matters of the world, finance, and probably you know get some of your knowledge uh, through this one hour that we would probably spend with each other. So, I guess let's just start right off the bat. I'd like to know. more about you know your journey until now starting from your early days maybe your childhood wherever you'd like to start and what exactly made you come to the point that you are right now in finance what brought you here well uh, first of all uh, i must congratulate you that uh, well not many students are interested in their professors so right there you score a few extra points right there <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> Having said that, I said that. I mean, you know, life has been just a wonderful journey. I turned fifty this year, so I oh, have yes. had occasion to uh, look back on a half a century of existence. And it turns out most of the things that happened happened by chance, or they just happened. So very little of it is like planned. I would say by me. I mean, so I would be lying to you if I said at the age of eight I really wanted to be a finance professor i certainly didn't have any such ideas uh i have to say that uh, teaching is very much a part of the family uh, vocation if you will my grandfather was a teacher of mathematics this is mm-hmm. my father's father after whom i'm named so he was ramana also so this man apparently was a very good teacher of math in high school apparently he wrote a textbook uh, i would love to to get a hand on that textbook uh, telugu i don't know if i will find it but nevertheless then a couple of uncles one was at bits pilani one was a long time professor at uh, iit kharagpur in the 
mathematical geology area. So my mom was a teacher. So my point is, this stuff has been happening in the family. family. So teach, yeah. And uh, it isn't very unusual for cousins and uncles to have uh, PhDs and so on and so forth. So uh, if you were bright, you had a PhD. That is sort of the thing that happened in this family. Uh, so uh, I suppose in many ways it was natural that I would end up where I did. However, growing up, I never had any clue as to what I would become, certainly in academic. Mm-hmm. I went to engineering like everybody else goes to engineering because mom and dad said, go to engineering, <laughs> I have to say. And at 16, I mean, I would be hard put to claim any foresight, any maturity with regard to career planning, etc. Certainly not back in my day. And so I ended up in NIT Varangal. And uh, of course, my dad didn't like that. He always thought I belonged in an IIT, apparently. And for the next 27 years that he lived, uh, he was not very happy about that one bit. <laughs> <laughs> this is middle class Telugu upbringing yeah. for you in the 70s. That's I don't totally. know if it's changed. <laughs> I mean, not just Telugu upbringing, I can tell you that much. <laughs> same, same in like all families, I guess, yeah. Right, so and uh, when he would uh, see like nieces or nephews or young people like you who went to an IIT, let's say, and he would have that look on his face, I said, what the hell happened to you? What the hell did you do? And I'm like, Dad, it's 27 years on. Can we let it go, please? So, <laughs> so that was a little bit of a thing going on with him throughout life. But seriously, I mean, it was... NIT was a great trip, yeah. NIT was a great trip. I think many of us grew up during those years. I'm sure it's the true for most of your generation also. College is where you grow up, you get out of home, you grow up, you uh, learn to work with people, learn to live in the world uh, somewhat imperfectly, which is the beauty of the whole process. Uh, my wife is also my classmate from NIT Varangal, oh, wow, okay. REC Varangal, as we used to call it. So I also found a wife there, extra bonus points for me. <laughs> so <laughs> so uh, it was a good trip. We had uh, four years of fun. Although I have to say, uh, in spite of very good teachers, etc., I had really very little aptitude for this uh, engineering stuff. Later on, I figured out that most of my classmates didn't either. And some of them went on to head supercomputing labs and so on and so forth. So the point is, uh, there's only so much you can do at 18 was something that was beyond me. So I just thought I was a complete failure with respect to engineering. So I said, boss, I have to do something else. And in my day, there were just three exams to write. Uh, there was the GRE and go abroad. Uh, honestly, we didn't have the money to even pay for the application fee. It was an expensive affair. So I'm not going there. So uh, GATE was another exam. Uh, you needed to study really hard for that stuff. You needed like proper engineering fundas, as we used to call them. And uh, sadly, I was empty of any such fundas. So <laughs> what am I going to do? So there is another exam called the CAT. And so I said, hello. This didn't require any subject knowledge. It required uh, analytics and some math and some English, which seemed to be within reach. And luckily, as they say in Hindi, lagya. So just happened <laughs> that I, the, you know, it's very funny when I look at my peers and some of my juniors uh, and several years like you guys, do you often wonder how life hinges on how your brain functions on like two or three critical days in your life? Like on those entrance exam day. <laughs> totally. I mean, uh, yeah. So just those few hours also, it's not even the day. It's just those few hours. Totally. If it, if it happens, it happens. Clicks, it clicks. Totally. And and I'm telling you, I mean, I got into I am Bangalore, I'm happy to be there and so on and so forth. But I'm going to bet on the very same day, like there is, I don't know, 10,000 people who are equally or um, equally bright or brighter than me, who didn't crack the cat that day for mm. reasons completely unknown to them or to you and me. I mean, it just so happened. So... This is what I mean by stuff happening. I mean, it's mm. not like I caused a lot of this stuff. Mm. 
Mm-hmm. So I just landed up at I in Bangalore. I had no clue what a business school was. I had no clue why I was there. All I knew was it was a very prestigious school and I am as a you know in India the brand name culture get you very yeah. fast especially in the middle class this is all a passport to mm-hmm. uh, moving above your class if you will economically speaking so this was generally thought of at home and in the neighborhood as a successful event in my life so uh, and that's all i cared about right and at 20 i just wanted validation from the world and uh, this was a perfectly good opportunity to get lots of validation hey ramarao son is when i am ramarao feels good ramna feels good <laughs> and the story <laughs> that was that and then uh, there was an internship in because we had a two year mba right uh, in the impgp and that's the first time i actually entered an organization and figured out mm-hmm. what what happens how does a company work who's the cfo who's right. this who's that i mean you'd seen this stuff in books but actually to be in a company and get paid for your time was a very exciting and novel concept i mm-hmm. learned some stuff there now finance i'll be very honest with you was because i couldn't get any of that stuff honestly <laughs> i couldn't because I I'm a firm believer that like you guys at ISB do you need some work experience before going to an MBA. Mm-hmm. Uh I think going fresh is kind of a raw deal because you miss out on a lot of learning on peer learning and so on. And when people start to talk about strategy or uh, even worse or like organizational behavior and talk about things like group think or like group dynamics mm-hmm. it's I have no clue about such things. Mm-hmm. I mean, unless you've been part of a team and worked for somebody, know a little bit about power, authority, hierarchy, how are you going to relate to this stuff? So today, actually, I think the most fascinating thing is how organizations work, what makes people and teams stay. Those are like mm-hmm. super cool issues. Actually, mm-hmm. if I could sort of rewind, I would maybe do something in that realm. but as it turned out finance had numbers finance had equations and uh, you know you come through the math and coaching and engineering route this is what you learn you learn theorem lemma proof in mm-hmm. india growing up and so this seemed like something that i could digest and that's how i got interested i still did not have a clue about what finance means like sort of in a global sense right mm-hmm. so i kn- i know the formula but i sort of don't no or care about how it relates to the world around me that took a long time mm-hmm. so that was the mba then i worked in this company called island affairs which of course in 2018 blew up and many people know about it therefore but in the time at the time it was a lovely company to work for from a financial learning point of view mm-hmm. now investment banking for the first time i was a bit shocked by the culture you might say i was very I come from sturdy middle class talk and to see like investment bankers in Bombay and lifestyles was a bit shocking to me certainly but it was a series of culture shocks and it was mm-hmm. a bit of a culture shock then I am but a bit more of a culture shock and then I live as well even bit more so uh, culture shock growing up I suppose it's the same thing <laughs> and so Uh, so that was a year and a half that I was in the US, and then I left for the US to do my PhD, uh, primarily because my wife to be was in the US, and she said, "Why don't we start a life in the US?" And I said, "Chalo, we'll try that." So I've always been like that. I've never really thought like. So the stupidest question, I'll be honest, is to me is where do you see yourself five years from now? No. I don't see myself 5 years from now anywhere. I just want to be alive, I suppose. That's the honest answer. <laughs> But beyond that, beyond that I don't know. I mean, life will take you places and uh eventually, but I mean today if you ask me, I think the important thing is that uh I just don't want to resist the flow of life. It's happening. Let go and sort of flow mm-hmm. with it. Mm-hmm. Then You know, if you have a reasonable brain and your limbs are functioning and you're willing to work hard, you'll make a living. 
Mm-hmm. I mean, none of us is going to go to Tarabra. Let's accept that. So, beyond that, you know, enjoy this. It's a short ride. Enjoy this. This is where I sort of... That was the exact uh, frame of mind in which I signed up for a PhD abroad. And then after that, magic happened. I really liked the research stuff. I really liked the research process. As part of my PhD program, I really got my feet wet in teaching a little bit because as PhD students, they ask you to do a little Mm. bit of summer teaching, just preparing you for the future. And I realized uh, around that time that academics was a lifestyle. So uh, it was not just a career move or a career choice. It's not like, should I choose consulting or product marketing? Mm -hmm. This is an entirely different lifestyle. Mm -hmm. And there was uh, something very different about it. There's something very exciting about it. There was a lot of things stressful about it. Uh, on balance, I liked it. And so I signed up and I suppose I've been doing that for the last 22 years now. And it's been a fun ride, Lou. What can I say? Awesome, awesome. So, Prof, can you just talk more about this academic lifestyle? What, like, how different is it from being in the corporate and how has that impacted like your personal life, if it has? Um, and like, is it different, like very, very different from what we, me as a person would get into corporate would you know, kind of face? Uh, several, several ways to approach that, right? So great question, though, because when I speak about lifestyle, at one level, I'm speaking about simple things like the ability to organize your day in a flexible manner. Mm -hmm. Okay, so in corporate, you're working with a bunch of people, Uh, your time is not truly your time, you're, you know, bound within the confines of your team and your management and uh, people working with you, for you and so on and so forth. And I see this with my wife, she's a corporate person, she's right now, it's like uh, night here and she's still on calls and she started in the morning and... Uh, there seem to be all these meetings and I'm all baffled as to what actually happens in all of these meetings, but something seems to be happening <laughs> and she seems to be, uh, you know, getting something done. Now, <clears throat> academics, unless I have a class at 10.15 or 12.30 or whatever it is, my time is really my time, mm-hmm. right? So, uh, example, throughout my children, I have two daughters, throughout their schooling, I was the one who made the parent-teacher meeting. Every Mm -hmm. single one of them. Mm -hmm. Every single one of them. I could take off in the middle of a Wednesday. I don't have to tell anybody. Uh, And that's the beauty of where I work also. My employer is being there. The system is very US-like in the sense that people trust you to sort of manage your time rather than sign into a register, Mm -hmm. sign in and out, punch in and out and so on. So there's an enormous amount of flexibility. So I can be there as a father, I can be there at those meetings. So one part of this lifestyle is really to think about how do you want to organize your life, right? Mm -hmm. And there's a great deal of flexibility that comes. The second aspect of this lifestyle for me is if you boil it down to its essentials, this is a job that actually pays you to learn. Mm Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's actually, if it blows my mind away that people are actually willing to pay me a very decent amount of money. And on a non-teaching day, like today, all I would do is either I'm figuring out stuff or I'm just reading a bunch of papers or I'm learning some new programming stuff or whatever. I'm just investing in myself and I'm getting paid for it. This is really cool. This is really cool. (laughs) And the third thing is, there's no real boss, as it were. I mean, obviously, the dean of ISB is my boss, and I report to him in a very real sense. He evaluates me, and so on and so forth. But uh, there is very little uh, direction he provides uh, in terms of micromanagement. For example, he wouldn't... uh, want to, is not particularly interested in, I'm sure, coming and telling me how to deliver the GPGP code, right, which I taught Mm -hmm. you guys, right? So his brief is very simple, Ramana, go teach well. I mean, that's really what he would Mm -hmm. wish all of my faculty or colleagues, and that's about it. So he's not breathing down my neck, there's a very healthy sort of 
autonomy that can be practiced. And again, beautiful. And fourth, if you're like me, just lifestyle-wise, I'm saying, I'm an intensely private person by mm -hmm. nature. I'm, I mean, yes, there is crowds into which I will wade and be friendly and gregarious. But uh, part of that is just my, you know, desire to also live in the world. But <laughs> leave me, leave me to myself. Uh, me, my book. I'm just a very happy camper. Just with a bunch of books or nowadays my iPad and just leave me alone for like three days. I'm happy to not emerge from a room as long as you supply me with food, etc. <laughs> so, so, so in that sense, like, you know, in academics, it's not uncommon to have a closed door office where you can close your door and read uh, for the whole day. And I've done that many times. I just read the whole day or study the whole day. Now, where else can I get a job like that? I haven't found such a job in corporate. So, this suits right. me. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying it's superior. It's the thing that works for me. Right. right? So, right. I suppose there is a self-selection. You know? I mean, some of us land up there. Any, any cons, Prof? Have you ever faced any cons? Well, you don't make a lot of money like your corporate uh, classmates. Like, uh, I'm on the IMB 94 WhatsApp group. Uh, which I talk about in class sometimes and uh, many of those guys have made a boatload of money. Uh, when I say guys, I mean fellows, fellies, everybody, right? All of them, mm -hmm. uh, they, they make a ton of money, which I don't. Uh, the nice thing is uh, I don't care, right? <laughs> right. I'm, just a happy, I'm just a happy camper. So that's one. The other thing is... Uh, there is this institution of tenure in schools like ISB, which is very US-like. It's essentially a seven-year probation. You mm -hmm. join as a rookie, mm -hmm. seven years, if you have X amount of research, which is quantity and quality, and uh, if your teaching ratings are okay, they will tenure you. And tenure is essentially permanent employment, right? So that is the US system. And uh, so if you don't make tenure, there is a con right there. <laughs> it's an upper out system. If you don't make it up, you're out, mm -hmm. right? So you, in the U.S., it's not so big a deal because there's a thousand universities. So mm -hmm. if you like water, eventually you'll find your own level, right? So you might start at Yale and not make it at Yale, and there's no insult in that, and you'll go and move on to the next uh, available university and keep working until you make tenure somewhere. Now, in India, this is a risky proposition. As I found out, when I came in, I was untenured and I didn't, I did not make tenure, mm -hmm. uh, which relates to the last part of your question. It hit me hard. It hit me really hard. I didn't make tenure. I had to leave ISB, but by then I was tied up to India and parents and there was a whole dynamic uh, going on in terms of my inability to return to uh, mm -hmm. the US mm -hmm. at the time. So now, what are the alternatives? If you're not at ISB, where are you? Right? I mean, certainly not at uh, so well-paid, so flexible, and so on. So there are downsides, right? You have to watch your outside options pretty carefully. Mm -hmm. I suppose I was remiss. It hit me pretty hard. Personally, I also went through some crises at the time. Uh, a bit of bouts of uh, addiction for, uh, also happened at the time. So... Yes, it can. It's it's very porous, and professional life feeds into your personal life. Uh, sometimes in uh, interesting and potentially <laughs> dangerous ways. I mean, it can happen. That that's that's just life. And uh, the other thing is, being an academic, you're in the company of all these academics. I mean, uh, professional self pride becomes a very large part of your image mm -hmm. and you start to take yourself take your role as an intellectual of some sort you start to take it pretty seriously and uh, if you don't get the appropriate validation from your peers right in terms of tenure or something else uh, it can it can be pretty debilitating mm -hmm. uh, yeah right so psychologically speaking. But so, yeah, and the higher up you are, obviously your peer group is bright. Yeah, and yeah. so, 
and so you're amidst a bunch of really bright people all the time. Uh, I suppose there is a bit of uh, trying to keep up, right? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. uh, if you're not built for it, uh, it can get pretty tiring. And it can ultimately, like, you know, really, you could crumble as a person. I mean, this stuff can happen. I'm not saying it happens to everyone. I'm not saying it happened to me all the way. I'm not saying it should happen, but uh, it, it's a pretty high stress environment. The reason I say that, Lou, is a lot of people have this notion that academics cushy job. Mm, yeah, that's that's what I mean. Uh, yeah, you put it in perspective to me also to right now. Yeah. Uh, right. So it isn't all that cushy. Yeah, mm. right. So my mother-in-law, for example, believes that <laughs> I have in a cushy job where her daughter <laughs> works very hard <laughs> as, you know, like a good mother. But uh, <laughs> yeah. you've been taking uh, digs, uh, Prof. <laughs> Quite a, this is the second mm. dig you're taking, huh? but I, I'm interested. I'm okay. <laughs> No, uh, I, I will survive, I think. <laughs> Let's put it this way. <laughs> no, but uh, I mean, see, in language, you guys will all understand. In academics, the if you look at stress as a process, the volatility part of stress is very low in academics. So there's no like peaks and troughs mm -hmm. going on. Corporate, I think, features a yeah. lot of uh, peaks and troughs. But the mean is uniformly higher in academic. Mm. So your mean is higher, mm. volatility is lower. It's a funny, it's a different process. So uh, in some, in many ways, you can't compare it. Unless you're in it, uh, it's tough to relate to it or empathize with it. Mm. So it's right. what it is. And I think the, there's a, also this factor that, you know, seeing results uh, when you are an academic is much more difficult than in a corporate. You can, because you have these KPIs, you have like these quick thing, quick short term targets. But I think in academics, you don't really have that. Probably kind of adds to all those. Absolutely. Things. And the research, especially, research, especially, is a very long process, right? So today, from idea to publication, a good finance journal of the kind we would aspire to publish in ISB hmm, would take two to three years. Okay, wow. Right? That's a long mm -hmm. uh, time frame. And meanwhile, you have these, uh, you know, reviews by referees and they'll come back with rejects or resubmit mm -hmm. and you submit. There's a whole process. You've got to get used to be patient with the long game, right? Mm -hmm. And even after publication, and to speak to what you were saying, it's not even clear how many of our academic papers are immediately applicable, right? To mm -hmm. the, uh, right. So, right. because research papers in general tend to be either data-driven papers, empirical papers tend to be what can I learn new about the world, mm -hmm. right? That's mm -hmm. the data-driven approach. Or you're writing theory where uh, you're trying to model interesting interactions or phenomena in the world around you. Now, neither of these can lay claim to solving specific business problems with any urgency or immediacy. Right. In fact, most of the time we don't care, right? <laughs> uh, which is which is the criticism of academics that, uh, uh, you know, corporate people would have. But then our standard response, and I agree with it, is there is uh, pure corporate, then there is solving immediate business problems, which, by the way, is called consulting. And then <laughs> you have... <laughs> Uh, the academic endeavor, which is different. So uh, let's not even sort of, sort of start beginning to compare these right. endeavors. Each has its place. That's where I have found peace nice. in that nice, nice, nice. Uh, framework, if you will. <laughs> yeah, it's awesome, awesome, Prof. So given that we spoke about this, what is it that you like more, research <coughs> or teaching? And uh, which one, why... Um, yeah, great, great again. And here, there's uh, clearly two camps, right? So uh, among my peers, for example, there's a lot of my colleagues at ISB and elsewhere who would first define themselves as researchers and then as teachers, right? So in their mind, there is a hierarchy that goes that way. Uh, I don't know why, from the very beginning, I always saw myself as a teacher first and the researcher next. Uh, 
which is not to belittle my own research. I'm very proud of the papers I've written. I enjoy the research process a lot. The process of just pondering a problem and coming up with original solutions to problems uh, is itself very gratifying. I mean, you feel very, very good when you crack a tough problem and make a paper out of it. There's no doubt about it. Having said that, uh, I'm very aware that unless you write like something super earth shattering, right? Most papers are forgotten. Mm-hmm. Okay, this is just the reality of it, right? So I always sort of take it in the following way. On my deathbed, will I remember the papers I have written? Okay, it's unlikely. Let me be honest with you. Will I remember all the good stuff that happened in my classrooms with the thousands of students? I think I will. Right? So for me, the gratification and impact that I can potentially make. See, in your class, how many am I reaching out to in one shot? I mean, in corporate finance, I taught 500 people, Mm -hmm. 500 students, 550. Now, I'm going to generously say about 10% of them may have been influenced by me. Let's call it 5%, okay? Let's not be too ambitious, 5%, (laughs) right? 25 people? Right. 20 people, mm-hmm. 20 people per batch have been around for 17 years at IELTS. That's already 300 people you've made. Right. Even if you say batch sizes were lower, whatever, right? 200 people. Right now, if I drop dead, I have 200 students who will say, oh, poor Prof Ramna died. I'm happy with that. I'm happy with that. Right? So I. Uh, there's a lot of ISB students and others who say, you know, Ramna, you got me started on financing that core course way back, right? And uh, uh, for example, Prasanna, you're a professor for uh, Indian, Indian financial system. system, right? He was in my class in 2011. Wow. And he always say, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> that's exact. I'm dating myself seriously here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> No, but uh, so Prasanna always uh, makes it a point to acknowledge, and I'm particularly proud of this, that he's a superstar, he's done very well in research, and obviously you guys know he's a very, very good teacher. He says, he still can't call me by first name, I don't know why, he calls me Prof even now. <laughs> uh, having this, he says, Prof, uh, I learned how to read a research paper in your class, thank you. Yeah, that's not feels awesome. feels good. Feels good, right? It's not about ego or stroking my ego at all. I know that I've made a difference to somebody's life a little bit. I'm not claiming Prasanna's success for myself. No, mm-hmm. he's put in a lot of hard work. He deserves every bit of it. But if I have had the privilege to be part of his journey for a few months, I'm happy to be that guy, right? So that way, uh, I'm a big teaching guy, and I think. You must be the judge of this. In class, I try my best to sort of... Yeah, I mean... Bring uh, that interest. <laughs> definitely, <laughs> I enjoyed your classes. But also, I mean, uh, I saw a video like recently on YouTube, uh, which was, you know, you were getting awarded uh, uh, Professor of the Year. Uh, I think PGP Pro had uh, awarded you that. And I mean, I was very inspired by your speech as well. A very funny speech and also pretty interesting. So listeners, if you guys can just go and check out uh, Professor Ramana Sonti's Professor of the Year speech on YouTube. Uh, Prof, uh, now my next question to you is, you like teaching. Uh, which was your favorite class that you remember the most teaching? What was that something that happened during class? And who's your best student that you thought anyone comes in mind? Hmm. Hmm. So best student is very tough because there is no really one Hmm. name that pops up. But uh, ISB, obviously, I I mean, out of 22 years, I've been here for the last 17. Uh, But I took a two-year break and went to BIT. So two ways I think of teaching, right? So one is graduate teaching, which is ISB teaching largely. There, I really enjoyed teaching a core course, which is no longer part of the curriculum, called investment analysis, right? That's mm-hmm. mostly portfolio theory and mm-hmm. diversification and lots of math. And You know, what I really enjoyed were teaching 
you know, class batches like 2011, 2012, 2012 in particular, I don't know what the chemistry was. Uh, those guys just loved the class and I loved being in their class and it was just phenomenally uh, successful. Many of those guys are my friends now. I, I mean, uh, my daughters, without telling me, go to their homes and oh, like nice. sack out in their homes. I mean, my younger one was in Singapore. She sought out a couple of my, our alums in 2012. Such good friends that she would call them and say, I'm feeling lonely. I'm going to come crash out at your place tonight. Mm -hmm. So this is, a, I mean, we've been to their weddings and all sorts of things, right? So, but all of those things started in that uh, core classroom. And you know, the best comments I got on the feedback form, you give comments. Mm -hmm. The best comments I got were, Prof, I am not going to take finance as a major, but I, and I'm not sure I understood everything correctly. But I sure as hell enjoyed the class. I really enjoyed the class. I liked the effort you put in. Uh, I wanted to be in class. For those two hours, I really wanted to be in your class, right? I wouldn't miss it for anything. Although I may not do any finance ever in my mm -hmm. life, right? But those are the best comments. Those are the best comments. It just means that uh, you got some paisa vasul out of those two mm -hmm. hours, right? <laughs> and there's a lot of paisa <laughs> when it comes to ISP, so it better be vasul, right? So that, 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 that uh, is. Now, undergrads is a different kettle of fish. So I taught at Big Spilani, the Hyderabad campus. It's amazing. I mean, the number of people who took their first finance course with me. Now, there's, I can count on my fingers one is an INSEAD in a PhD in finance uh, program. One is at Columbia in a PhD in finance. One is at Harvard Business School in an MBA. A uh, couple are on Wall Street after doing a MS in computation finance from Cornell. Uh, I just went, this Cornell the boy and girl got married recently. Yeah, I just okay. went and attended the reception. And even at the wedding, yeah, I mean, reception, these two kids were like, well, not kids anymore, I suppose. Uh, they, they were like, you know, you taught us finance and where, I mean, they were very proud. It's almost like they were showing up to their dad, right? Ki, look where I've come, right? I was in your beginner finance class way back in 2014 and look at me in 2022. Uh, ah, well, my eyes filled up when I just uh, saw those kids. And, I mean, it's very happy also that they're getting married and such, but this is what they introduced me to their parents as. This is the guy who got me started on my path. That feels pretty damn good, man. Mm -hmm. I can tell you that. So, <laughs> so, I feed off of a lot of this, right? From right. feedback from mm -hmm. students. And again, not an ego stroking exercise. I, I, it might have been like maybe 20 years ago. Not anymore, right? So for me, it's like, wow, you know, these guys really went somewhere, didn't they? Pretty cool. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Prof, so I asked around a few people if they had any questions to ask you, uh, you know, regarding finance or anything that they had in mind. So, yeah, I do have a few questions. So I think I'll get to that now. Uh, so the first one is, um, what do you think will be the impact of the oncoming or like, which is going to come like the recession um, on the world? in India and to youth like us who have, who are on the cusp of just finishing our MBA. Well, to put it in perspective, I mean, you are sitting on a very vantage perch of, I mean, where are you with respect to your population, your country's population? You're in the top 0.5% right now mm -hmm. talking to me. So let's be honest, recession, no recession, you, you, you guys are foolproof, right? So you guys are needed, you guys have the skill set, and I don't need to suck up to you. You've been well trained, whether you chose to accept the training or not, <laughs> uh, and, <laughs> and you've gotten jobs. So you, you guys will survive, right? Now, yes, the job market is not as hot as you would like it to be, but you know what? It is never as hot as you would like it to be. Okay. And you'll be fine. You know, 
That's one thing. Yes, there is all this layoff and freeze is going on in tech and yeah, I know product management roles are not as plentiful as they were. But these are temporary. You know that in a couple of years. And by the way, even in a hot market, how many of your caliber of students are sticking to their first job Mm -hmm. uh, post-MBA? You're turning over pretty fast. You're always looking for the next best thing. And the same thing will play out, except that, you know, it's a little sluggish right now. So you'll probably hold on, uh, at least keeping your EMIs in mind or whatever it is for now, which is perfectly rational. There is no doubt about it. But, you know, the time will come and you will, uh, in a year or two, again, things will ease up a little. And by the way, India, yes, there are freezes with the multinationals and so on, but the startup ecosystem, etc., seems to be pretty optimistic. And I actually, in one way, uh, you would hope that valuations, etc., return to earth a little mm-hmm. bit uh, in India also compared to what was happening two years ago. So maybe this is not the worst thing in the world. Certainly not for you guys. Okay. So uh, now, again, the US, I mean, there's a lot of noise and there's a lot of news that is circulating and so on and so forth. Because everybody is looking to the U.S. But nothing ever happens to the U.S. They have the world's world's reserve currency. They have uh, massive natural resources. And they're the mightiest military power on the planet. So this country is not going anywhere. You know, the people, actually the countries that are suffering right now are in Europe uh, right now. I mean, not to mention other parts of the world which... uh, weren't very high flyers to begin with, right? So the, the the steepness of the curve down is being felt in Europe right now, mm-hmm. right? And that's where the hurt is, if you will, right? So you guys are largely immune to this. I think you'll get through this pretty easily. I mean, if you could get through the pandemic. And also, long perspective, Lou, honestly, because... Today, I mean, being a 50-year-old and in that age group, and I lost uh, some people to COVID who were seemingly healthy, right? I mean, some of them were, you know, employees at ISB and so on, who were like in their 30s or 40s. And to take a long perspective, I mean, honestly, for me, I mean, although you're not supposed to feel like this at your age, because at your age, you feel invincible, immortal, and so on and so forth. But uh, I'm of a different generation, so I'm just grateful to be alive, man. Seriously. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, if, so maybe you should also think, you know, we survived the pandemic. We made it through this and we opened up. And, uh, you know, if you plan to make a life in India, I mean, thank God you're in a democracy that actually functions. However, imperfectly it functions. And... Uh, is there ways to improve uh, ways of doing business in India and so on and so forth? Yes, of course, there there is. Uh, there's a lot of stuff that can be done with startups and so on and so forth. And it's what it is. I mean, uh, this country stumbles from, uh, lurches from point A to point B. This country doesn't smoothly glide from A to B. That has been my experience living here for many years. So... You'll be fine. Uh, just take the long perspective. You, you're just fine. I All think. Right. All right. Awesome. So, Prof, you spoke about startups. Uh, how can we not talk about startups having, you know, <laughs> you have taught us that. Uh, so, uh, you, like you said, you know, they were highly valued and now, you know, they might come back down. But what is your kind of, uh, what do you think investors and new entrepreneurs should be like in the lookout for in the future? you know, after this, after this bout of recession. So one thing is, like I said before, I think valuations coming down across the board is not such a bad idea. Mm -hmm. First of all, Mm -hmm. right. There's a, uh, you know, I remember showing a table. I don't know if it was in your class where uh, Professor Ramadran had done a correlation matrix of value versus EBITDA, value versus right. sales, and so right, on. Right, right. And the highest correlation, remember, was between enterprise value and number of users rather yeah. than anything else. Mm-hmm. So what are the lessons that is periodically true? Periodically true. In spite of 
the youth resistance to this old idea is that business has to generate profits, believe it or not. <laughs> It does have to. At some point, you have to show me the profit, right? So, when the internet just burst onto the scene, and you're obviously young to remember this, right? Uh, I was around, very much around and adult in 1997, 98 and such. They said, oh my God, this is a new business. And paradigm is a very often misused word, which was misused then also. There are a new way of doing business, new economy, this, that and the other. I remember the number of books written on doing business in the new economy. Well, what are you going to do now? You're not going to generate profits anymore. Uh, so, so those time-tested principles will remain the same, except sometimes we, we tend to go through patches where we forget those principles. Mm-hmm. Now it is time to remember, Are there is something called cash flow. There is something called profitability. And this is good. Everybody should remind themselves of this, right? And... Uh, the other thing is we often think that these venture capitalists and so on are uh, crystal ball gazers or prognosticators of a special kind. It turns out they're not. Uh, it turns out they're not. They're as they, they're like you and me. They went to business mm-hmm. school and they've developed some thumb rules and gut feel for certain industries and. They know that business is, as I say in class, you know, one out of the ten bulbs will light up, the rest will go bust, and that's that. I mean, they know the nature of their business. So, uh, so I don't think there is a particular reason to expect them to be any wiser than you, for example. I mean, wiser than the average man on the street, absolutely. But when I say you, I mean you with the business school education. Mm-hmm. Uh, you, you know the basic. I mean, there's no more secrets left. We've told you everything we know in class. Believe me. <laughs> so, so you you know this stuff, right? So, uh, I mean, these are just ten years, twenty years. Your seniors. That's about it, right? So, uh, so what should we look at now? Here is the thing, right? My personal beef, and this is only opinion. No data to back me up. I think. What I mean, clearly you've heard the statistics, I mean, we've got like the third largest ecosystem in the world, all of that good stuff. You must have prepared for placement, you read all those reports and such. The the, the key is though, how many of these startups solve India specific problems? Right? Mm-hmm. Is something that I don't know. I don't know the stats on this. So so for example, uh, you know, we're woefully low, woefully low on, uh, and these are my pet beefs, primary health and, edu- and uh, pr- primary education. That is where this country is failing the government, every successive government, not to point fingers and so on and so forth. Uh, successively, we've just failed spectacularly when it comes to, I mean, you have policy, you have right to education, all of those things. But the reality is that uh, is every child in India getting educated to class 10, class 12, class 10? No. No. Does everybody have access to primary health? No. So you and I, we have these discussions and valuations. So I'll be very honest and confess to you that because I'm a business school, I talk this language with people who are like me, that is you. But very often I... And I suppose part of this is age. I, very often I sort of zoom up to, zoom out to the 30,000 feet and say, what the hell are we doing here? You know, we're really focusing on this small sliver and it's important. It's terribly important not to minimize or diminish the importance of this. But where are the real problems getting solved? And uh, if there are startups that are working in those areas, which can even make tiny incremental delta differences. Those are the places I would put my money on personally, right? So, again, not to sound like an activist of any kind, but I think very periodically we we have this glib talk going on, even in business schools, where we say, oh, those guys are dispossessed and, you know, their lands are being taken, whatever, and then... Everybody, there's this term called development and progress, which sort of, uh, on whose back 
is this country developing or progressing is a question I'm afraid we don't ask very often in business school because it's not uh, done. It's not done. I don't know why it isn't done, but it isn't. But that's where, you know, these are the debates which we need in our universities. These are the startups that need to happen. And you can make money, you can make profits, all of those things that you learn, right? That not, nothing is going to be compromised. But if Zomato delivers me five minutes late, I'm okay with that, personally. <laughs> I'm not looking for like instant dude peda. I mean, that is not my <laughs> idea of a uh, cool startup. No, it doesn't, right? So, are you solving real problems for me, right? Uh, which can actually impact. Because if, if you remember, maybe slightly before your time, there was all this talk about fortune at the bottom of the pyramid, right? Remember, mm-hmm. TK Prala and company uh, got rid of this all. Uh, they came up with this idea of fortune at the bottom of the pyramid and so on. So what happened to that bottom of the pyramid and uh, where is the fortune? Who's mining it? And are startups involved in that? I think that's really where the action is, not even should be. That's where it it needs to go, mm-hmm. right? So, uh, yeah, I, I mean, that, I mean, a better payment system is great. It's uh, absolutely a need of the hour. And, but how many people in this country are on that on the information platform. highway, right? In that, whatever, that bits going from here to there, very loosely in my disorganized mind. How many people are part, part of the traffic? I don't know. Mm-hmm. Because I encounter these people. I live in the city. I don't live in ISB. I don't live in an island, I live in the city, and I meet these people every day. These are the people who say, Chai ke liye paise do, mm-hmm. when I walk out, right? And so, are these people anywhere in the equation or the general calculus of the whole ecosystem? I'm sorry, I seem to have completely lost the question, but... No, 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 I mean... We are this is where I am. Mm-hmm. Right. I think we were on track only. I mean, yeah, makes sense, Prof. I think uh, you posed some serious questions for us folks uh, of the future. Um, I think uh, two more questions. One is, uh, what do you think about AI taking over stuff, Prof? I saw you, you know, um, studying programming yesterday. And uh, I just, uh, I mean, recently, right before that, I read an article also where, you know, there's a lot of work in AI where, you know, you just type in like normal text, it does the programming for you, it builds the websites for you, it builds the apps for you. Now, similarly, there are uh, AI programs that are coming out which can do your personal finances for you, can, can do your accounting for you. So, do you think AI is going to take over finance someday? And uh, do you think, you know, finance professionals need to be worried in that front? Yes, I think the answer is yes. Uh, I think it has enormous potential. I personally believe uh, in things like financial advisory, in maybe there will be, you know, the deepest problems in finance are things like trying to, let's say, assess your risk tolerance so mm-hmm. that I can build a portfolio for you. Mm-hmm. Now, traditional ways are making you answer a bunch of questions and sort of get at your risk aversion somehow indirectly. I have a feeling that uh, machines can be, uh, I mean, the kind of data that they have, um, I hate to sort of use all the data against myself, but (laughs) but I I think if you had an overall picture of what books I do, what websites I visit, what uh, company I keep, uh, who's in my communities virtually, I think these are things that can give you, for example, a very, very uh, fine gradation, fine level of handle on my risk aversion. Then if you add me, answer a bunch of 20 questions, old fashioned questions, right? My banking behavior, Mm -hmm. lots of stuff, right? That there's lots of what used to be soft information that is now being codified into hard 
information in bits right. and bytes. And AI is particularly good at sweeping up like a giant vacuum cleaner all this data about me and sort of sucking it out of the universe, the virtual universe, and building a cogent picture. I think those questions will be begin to be answered by AI increasingly, mm -hmm. right? And so, yes, so financial advisory, for example, there's a huge role for AI, right? Uh, AI can start driving your portfolio choices, right? Mm -hmm. uh, or advising you on your portfolio choices and so on. But again, again, what percentage in this country is in that game? Mm -hmm. Right? To the extent it is, yes. Uh, I think AI is... So your traditional wealth management roles, for example, will get severely impacted. Right. Uh, right? Uh, so, so a lot of this stuff is coming. There is no doubt about it. What right? about... What about Having valuation? said that investment valuation... <laughs> I don't know. I mean, know. given because that, you know, all I've learned, I mean, uh, through finance in college is that you know, it's it's more of an art as well. I mean, there's so many assumptions and so many things that you bring in as, and it's so individual and like what the person is thinking. How can, would AI be able to come in there and do something there? I have my own doubts. I have my own doubts, right? And valuation, as you really correctly pointed out, is the biggest crapshoot of the whole finance apparatus. In fact, December 5th, the day before, I think, there was a wonderful article in Ken about, uh, you should go read it, everybody, on uh, the, in the Ken, right? On uh, Apparently, every startup has to go through an independent valuer, and who the heck are these valuers, and how do they often get it wrong? And, you know, one of the themes in that article is reflecting exactly what you just stated, that, you know, this is this DCF, it has the veneer of sophistication, some mathematics is involved, some, you know, squares and exponents are floating around, looks cool. <laughs> but in the end, it's all a bunch of assumptions, is what they say, right? Now, unfortunately, uh, this is an exercise in prognostication, and especially, see, AI can is very good in what I know, in substituting for your experience how good is it in substituting for your intuition hmm. i don't know i don't know yet i mean this is what i know and it's a very loose answer because i'm not plugged into the cool cutting edge of the technology but the day human intuition is Artificially replicated, boy, uh, yeah, that, that, that opens up, forget about this, I mean, this, this, this forget about finance is small, now, now, now you're talking about like whole vistas opening up to mm -hmm. AI, right? It could well happen, I mean, I'm, not, I'm never say never, yeah, I mean, mm -hmm. you don't know, uh, I mean, I've seen amazing things in just the short life of mine, so who knows what <laughs> in store. But I really hope AI doesn't like poetry, doesn't write poetry and doesn't make music. Oh, it's, it's already doing that. Oh, problem. I know, but uh, I, I, <laughs> can you please let me be in denial? For a <laughs> okay. <laughs> because, because for me, you know, extracting from finance and research and this and that, the most sublime moments I've enjoyed in my life. A reading an exquisitely written book or listening to, you know, I want Ileraja to play the violin. Mm -hmm. I don't want AI to play the violin. <laughs> I don't know how to say it better than that, right? right? right. So those are moments when you get out of your yourself and just truly happy in that moment, right? If AI is going to generate those moments, great. But, uh, you know, I would really like to put a name to that moment and say, you know, Lou gave me this moment, or Eli Raja gave me this moment, or S.P. <laughs> Balasuri gave me this moment, and not a Don't. program. But that's my denial. Huh? Don't uh, <laughs> have to be tied down to it. <laughs> awesome, awesome, Prof. So, last question, Prof, um, which is, I think it's, I think one of, I think a key question, really, is 
in finance we really talk about looking at things in the long term you know how do we discount stuff from the long term and having that long term perspective right. is super important but we often see that most of the people around us including me are like very myopic in their choices in their day to day mm-hmm. beliefs etc mm-hmm. what is your advice as a finance professional to kind of you know how do we stop looking myopic and start looking long term and how do we i talk about i talk about careers or otherwise anything otherwise right so i think uh, so why career, this question yeah. sorry sorry to cut you off yeah. but please, why this question is coming in is because of also what you spoke about the careers by bit right like you said you're just happy to be alive right after seeing you know what happened in covid uh but you know we are we are thinking about the recession we are thinking about the next job in hand all of that so it's coming from a point of you know looking at careers but i think it goes beyond that as well yeah right so, so you know that is a that is a super deep question okay so uh, i'm asking, only going to i'm be asking the right the, person i think <laughs> <laughs> i don't know about that but i can only speak from some experience you know what i have observed and this is with complete hindsight right so obviously i can only share mm-hmm. experience that i've learned from the whole notion of success is very elusive it's not clear what constitutes success i don't know what success is right so so i've thought i've grappled with this question a lot right i told you like i don't make as much money as my peers from school let's say am i unsuccessful i mean i'm not asking you to be polite i'm just saying mm-hmm. that is a question one can throw out and debate for example uh so if there is no sort of set standard of success right then what are we working towards right is the question you want to ask yourself right so in other words what is the meaning of this trip around the sun for a few times what does this whole thing mean right i'm not asking a deep philosophical question as to why are we put on this no i'm here right let's take it as i'm here i'm the world is real i'm here i'm in the middle of it what the heck am i supposed to do with my time okay i got all these degrees i have this education blah 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 i know i can make it a uh, living no i can make an average of what going by your statistics 35 lakhs or 40 lakhs whatever the heck it is right i can make that very comfortable life is that it i mean if you if you just chose to coast with that i wouldn't blame you who am i to blame you i mean what gives me the right to judge you if that's mm-hmm. what you settle for there, there's nothing wrong i mean when i say settle i don't mean in a derogatory way i mean you just want to do that and do a bunch of other stuff with your life right so it's not clear to me what success is i think success is terribly elusive and i think self selection wise all of us including myself who land up in b school are what are known as type a type a personalities right mm-hmm. so we have this hankering for the next best thing mm-hmm. right and partly that's what brings us to b school especially brand name b schools in fact why did you care so much for the brand because right. you want to you want to be counted among your peers and so did i right i'm not blaming you i have to i am exclusively for that i told you i didn't know anything about b school but i wanted to be part of that crowd because for life i will have that stamp of having mingled with the best and brightest of my generation right so in that uh, having done all this and meandered through life for 50 years i'm not sure so today i figured out one thing okay that at least with me the only thing that makes sense to me as a something to live towards is i want to be useful Okay. so i settled on this right after a lot of introspection dealing with like i told you personal traumas dilemmas this that addiction all kinds of crap eventually i landed up with this i said so i literally and i'm not exaggerating here at all i literally wake up in the morning 
and ask the question, how can I be useful today? Mm-hmm. And it could be very simple stuff. I'm not talking about very lofty things. I could make a cup of tea for my wife. I'm being useful because she slept late because she had a bunch of meetings and she's tired and maybe she would like some nice ginger tea in the morning. <laughs> I'm being useful. Believe me. <laughs> so when I enter the classroom, I'm like, can I be useful? Right? So when I'm with my staff or colleagues, I'm asking, can I be useful in this situation? Right? And that is what has kept me going. Therefore, from a career perspective, what you have to do is, I think, train yourself to be useful to somebody. If the goal is money, you will never be satisfied. Mm-hmm. Never. I'm, I'm, I'm guaranteeing you. You will never be satisfied. I'm not saying don't turn. No. By all means, earn a good living. Live a good life. I, go my, I mean, I've earned a decent amount of money in my life. I have a lot of trappings around me which, are, which make my life very comfortable. There is no nobility in poverty. I've seen that end of things in my childhood, not fun, right? Middle class life or lower middle class life was not fun for me, right? So I'm not advocating nobility in poverty. I'm just saying that that will be a byproduct. So at your age, my recommendation is spend the next 10 years working super hard at becoming really useful, becoming really good at being useful to something or somebody. I don't care what your cause is. If you want to break stones for whatever reason, be the best stone breaker in the world at the end of 10 years. And then the money will come. Mm. This is the beauty. Money will come rolling in. Right? You won't even have to think about it. You guys are super well qualified. Money will come, trappings will come and so on. Now in life, if you say we are myopic, well, think about if if somebody in your listener group is thinking about, let's say, uh, in the market for a life partner, right? If Even if not marriage, if you want to be with somebody for the rest of your life. I would argue that uh, the last thing you want to be is myopic, yeah? You know, you really want to ask yourself a question like, you know, when this person doesn't look as cool as they do right now in their youth, but I still want to be with them. Hmm. Apparently my wife said yes, and therefore I'm bald and still (laughs) she's around with me. So, (laughs) so apparently some people, no, I just hit the lottery, but, uh, but really the, 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 today actually the funny thing, and I speak this personally from experience. My wife and I often, we just celebrated last week 27 years of uh, being married to each other. Well, thank you. Uh, You should congratulate her for surviving (laughs) me, (laughs) obviously. But seriously, we just thought about it, right? We were friends and then we were in love and then we were married and then we were young parents and now we are parents but older (laughs) and now the kids have flown the coop and now... Where are we back to? Every morning we have a ritual, we'll have tea. Either I make tea or mostly she makes tea because she doesn't like my tea, even if I try (laughs) to be nice. Now, when we have tea for 15 minutes, we we think, after all this, where have we come back to? We're again friends, just like in our Isivarangal campus. We're we're just in a better (laughs) physical space, like more... Uh, comfortably appointed, I suppose. But so it is that friendship that will sustain us until one of us dies. So is this a game for the long term? I can tell you at the age of 23, when we married, we were both looking long term. Mm -hmm. So uh, somehow we had a, we were attacked by uh, a sudden attack of maturity, I suppose, at that point. (laughs) And we got it right, right? So it is possible. So career wise, you know, there will be ups and downs and there is no limit to the tie that you can touch. But be clear about uh, what you want to be. I mean, today I am very clear. I want to be useful. If I am not useful, I will just check out of the place immediately. Right? Not possible when you have a bunch of EMIs hanging over your head, I understand. But you have to balance the practical with the long term. Right? I think it's possible. I think you guys are all... People of your generation, not just the IHB, but your listeners, 
today the generation younger generation is savvy enough to get this they are smart enough mm-hmm. to get this and they are willing to sort of do this very intelligent trade off I, i mean i wouldn't uh, i think your generation will i look at my kids who are not that much younger than you actually and uh, they seem to be doing fine without me which causes me a little of little bit of a problem <laughs> but <laughs> they seem to be doing just fine i think i think what gives me great satisfaction is just from a far distance i'm just watching them grow and the view and for that matter any of you guys uh, it's just a pleasure yeah? i mean you guys are doing just fine i mean uh, the problem is when we are in the middle of a bunch of type a personality this crisis of confidence keep erupting constantly mm-hmm. and there is especially in the age of uh, texting and instagramming and so on uh, the peer pressure at not just during placement and such even otherwise it's just mm-hmm. severe right and the only antidote to that is trusting in yourself trust in yourself you're smart you're good i will <laughs> what's not to feel happy about or proud about right and life will come life will come to you whether you want it or not It's just humility grace gratitude these are these are the things one one needs weapons to carry you through that journey that's what today i feel a lot of gratitude there was a time when at your age where if you ask me i'm not home and all this happened when you became a prof at the age of let's say i was 28 when i finished my phd uh and if somebody asked me from now who made this happen i think my answer would have been me me and me only today i have back to differ uh, with myself with my younger self mm-hmm. i don't think it was me it was a lot of people yeah it was a parent and your whoever right in the whole village that made you happen so yeah so total gratitude and I have been in the company of so many scholars that I've stopped being cocky about my own abilities. Thank God for that. <laughs> PhD will do that one thing for you, by the way. It'll make you really humble. <laughs> so these are good qualities to have. I think you'll be fine. But uh, yeah, I mean, that that that. I don't know. If this is a very rambling answer to a very short question. But uh, you. you picked an academic to interview so sorry <laughs> <laughs> all right perfect perfect uh thank you so much prof any parting thoughts that you have uh anything that you want to share uh yeah close yours uh parting thoughts i think i may have just shared these at the, you know i uh i think uh really the key to sort of life i don't know how to describe this is for me i've figured out that uh, a lot of times i have to yield to life uh, gracefully without resisting mm-hmm. it's very difficult because every instinct of mine i'm trained because i'm analytical and so on right i'm trained to believe that i got this i can solve this i can solve this problem i can jump over this hoop uh, through this hoop or over this obstacle you know a lot of times uh, the, the humbling experience life gives you you cannot you have to just gracefully yield to the flow and uh, in not resisting there is a lot of mm-hmm. beauty i think i mean that is how i live my life now actually it's very the way cool trip actually i don't know how to describe it it's like you know let things happen to you right i mean not bad things i mean don't go into dark alleys where, where the thugs hang about i mean and wait for things to happen to you their bad things will happen to you but I, you know what i'm trying to say in the larger scheme of things and this is uh, this is a lovely journey and actually the other thing is time goes by very fast people will tell you this but when you experience only you'll understand mm mm-hmm. I can't believe I'm 50. I can't believe they're graduating people in 2022. I thought graduation ended in 1992. <laughs> I graduated <laughs> by BTEC. But you know what? Suddenly 30 years have gone by. So uh, this thing zips past so so fast. I mean it's such a it's such an astonishing rapidity that 
I think it's very important to sort of slow down once in a while. I don't know, meditate or travel or whatever it is. And your generation is, I think, very savvy. So my generation was still sucked up in like buy a flat and pay the mortgage and die. I mean, that's just like a bad model to live, I think. <laughs> I think there's more to You know, the last thought I will share with you is just something that came to me. This house I'm sitting in, right? It sits in a plot of about 450 square yards, right? Just thought came to me like, I don't know, 20 days ago, that this 450 square yards would have been laid claim to as theirs by how many people? <laughs> you with me? Right? So king noblemen, commoners, I don't know who owned the damn thing like 500 years ago, 1000 years ago. But yet, somebody felt a great affinity for this little piece of land and said, this is mine. I will not let you encroach on this. This is mine. I will piss around it. I will establish territory. And I will... Own. You know, I'm doing the same thing right now, apparently. But the reality is, I mean, this is mine for a little time and then boom, I don't know what the heck is going to happen to this 50 years down the line. Astonishing, isn't it? I mean, so you think when somebody asks you, are you renting or do you own your house? You proudly you say, yeah, I own the house. What the heck do you own? Good question to end this chat yeah. on, right? Yeah, good <laughs> it's not clear. <laughs> it's not clear what we own. So this is where I am right now. So, yeah, it might be totally crazy, but I have to thank you, Lou, for oh, yeah, thank you, thank you so much, Allowing me to be here. Thank you. Yeah, so thank you so much, Prof. I mean, I had a great conversation with you. Uh, the past one hour, 15 minutes was just absolutely awesome. Uh, and thank you so much, listeners, uh, for tuning in. Uh, I'm Lou, and this is Lucid. Catch you again next time. Bye-bye.